أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمد ونشكر ونستعين ونستغفر ونتوب إليه نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له نشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله رب الشرح لي صدري وسل لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم everyone What an incredibly beautiful gathering of young people, young hearts, young minds coming together to seek the pleasure of Allah in seeking beneficial knowledge. You know, subhanAllah, as Brother Asad was speaking and presenting about helping hand, I couldn't help but be transported back to several years ago when, alhamdulillah, I had the honor of traveling with the Youth for Jordan group out to the camps on the border of Syria in Jordan. And as I had taken this trip, I remember being there and listening to story after story after story. Stories of widows who had lost their husbands, stories of children who had lost their parents, stories of people who had been broken by the war, broken by pain, broken by difficulty. And yet in every story that was shared, there would be a common thread, which was Alhamdulillah. Over and over again, we would hear of the devastation, and yet each time we would hear those individuals sharing their story repeat, Alhamdulillah. And I began to wonder, what is it about the mindset of these individuals who have been so tested by Allah, who have truly been tested by loss, as we are promised in the Quran, where Allah Azza wa Jal tells us that surely we will be tested, and oh, were these refugees huddled in camps tested? Yet with every test that they would recount, there would be a contentment, a sense of acceptance, a sense of understanding, a sense of positivity even, that led me to constantly question, where does this emotional resilience come from? Where does a mindset that sees the best in this dunya come from? Where does a mindset that is anchored to a love of Allah and a gratitude in the hikmah of Allah, where does it come from and how can we find it? SubhanAllah, when we think of the word mindset, it is comprised of a very powerful part in terms of that word, mind. And the mind is powerful because Allah Azza wa Jal in the Quran references the faculties of the mind many times. And we see that in the first creation of Adam alayhi salam, the first creation of human beings, Allah Azza wa Jal speaks to the angels who ask, why are you creating man who will cause difficulty and strife and chaos on earth? And Allah Azza wa Jal responds to the angels by saying there is a ilm, a knowledge that Allah Azza wa Jal has that they do not have. And yet we see this reference to the ilm being brought again when Allah Azza wa Jal speaks to the angels of the creation of human beings and tells us, tells them, Allama Adam al asma'a kulliha that it is all of the names that were taught to Adam. There is a knowledge that is given in the minds of human beings that essentially defines our mindset based on how we choose to respond to this knowledge. So when Adam السلام, and Hawa السلام, were created, we see that it is when they are taught, when they are given ilm, when their mind is receptive to seeking knowledge, to gaining knowledge, a knowledge that is granted by Allah, they are then put in a situation where they get to choose. Because our choices are often reflective of our mindset. And they are put in a situation in which they are tested with that choice. When Iblis whispers in their ear to disobey Allah, 
there is a choice that is made in that moment. And it is a choice that is made because the ilm was there. If Adam alayhi salam did not have the ilm of not to eat from a specific tree, a specific fruit in Jannah, then there wouldn't have been a choice. But a conscious choice was made. But look at the beauty of a God-centric mindset, of a mindset that is anchored to the love of Allah. Because upon making this choice, when Allah Azza wa Jal speaks to Adam alayhi salam and Hawa, there is an understanding from Adam alayhi salam that this was not the right choice. There is an understanding that is rooted in the ilm, in the mind, that this was a choice that Adam alayhi salam regrets. And this is the essence of tawbah, this is the essence of repentance. That when we have ilm, that something we do, something we say, may hurt someone, may harm someone, may displease Allah in some way, we have a choice. And if our mindset is a mindset that is anchored in the love of Allah, then the choice we will make will be to seek forgiveness, to seek the forgiveness of Allah, and to seek the forgiveness of the one we harmed. But what if we are the ones that are harmed? What happens when our mindset is so drained? When our mindset shifts and we only see the negative and we can no longer say Alhamdulillah or we say Alhamdulillah but we don't feel it. What happens when harm has befallen us? When we have been broken and we are struggling to see that which is good in the world? when we are struggling to see that which is positive. Because we have all been there. We have all been broken. Whether we are broken by the friend who we trusted, who betrayed us. Whether we are broken by the person who we thought would always stand by our side who is no longer there. Whether we are broken by a toxic relationship within our households, within our families whether we are broken by circumstances beyond our control, whether we are broken because we have suffered harm and loss and pain and difficulty, which Allah Azza wa Jal promises us as we will taste in this dunya, whatever it is that may have broken us, it does not need to break our mindset. We should not allow it to break our mindset and shift our perspective from living alhamdulillah Believing Alhamdulillah and acting upon Alhamdulillah and instead sinking into the depths of despair where there is the feeling of heaviness, a feeling of loss in which we cannot come up to the surface from that loss. In one of my earlier talks yesterday, in one of the da'wah sessions, I brought up a situation, a story that I think relates very much to this topic as well. Some of you may be familiar with a teacher by the name of Mrs. Jane Elliott. She was a teacher, a third grade teacher in 1968, who conducted an experiment with her third graders. And she wanted to teach these third graders more about segregation, more about discrimination, more about the pain which isolation can cause an individual. And so she conducted the brown-eyed, blue-eyed experiment. And in this experiment, on the first day she conducted it, she invited all of the children in the classroom who had blue eyes to sit in the front of the classroom. And she told all of the children with brown eyes to sit in the back of the classroom. And then she told all of the children with the blue eyes, you are beautiful, you are strong, you are brave, you are smart, you are important. And she told all of the children with the brown eyes, you are dirty, you are unloved, you are not strong. You will not amount to anything. And what was incredible that happened throughout the week is that those blue-eyed students who used to consistently do poorly on exams and quizzes and tests did amazingly well academically during that week. Those brown-eyed students who traditionally were at the top of the class were failing their quizzes and their papers and submission of assignments that week. On the playground, the blue-eyed children would crowd together and leave out the brown-eyed children. They would taunt them, they would put them down, and the brown-eyed children would isolate. 
would turn into themselves and pull away. Those who had been at the top of the class, the most popular children, now after being told that they were worthless, now after being told that they were not smart, they believed those words. They believed those words and they chose that ilm, that knowledge, to become a part of how they see themselves. And we go through this every day. Every time we scroll in our Instagram and we see the pretty girls dressed in a certain way, the attractive males who've worked out and have a six pack, when we look at the pictures of where people are, when we scroll our Instagram, when we look at our Snapchat, when we look at our B Reels or whatever it is that we're using these days, we begin to believe that we are not good enough, that we are worthless, that we are not as smart, not as beautiful, not as successful as this person or that person. And we see it happening not just online, but in our day-to-day -day lives as well. When someone tells you that you are less than, don't believe them. Don't believe them because your value is not defined by the relationship that has been broken due to toxicity. Your value is not defined by the person who puts you down and says you're not kind, you're not smart, you're not truthful. Your value is not defined by that which those who try to break you infuse within your mind. That is not the mindset of our deen that Allah Azza wa Jal has guided us towards. Your value is defined by something so much greater and your mindset needs to be anchored to that which is greater. Allah Azza wa Jal tells the angels upon the creation of Adam alayhi salam that he has given this creation knowledge. We have this ilm that Allah Azza wa Jal has granted to us, not to the angels not to other creatures, but it is a trait that we as human beings have. But the mind is powerful, and the mind can lead us down pathways that impact not just how we see the world, but how we see ourselves as well. And this is where the struggle lies. Many of you may be familiar with a movie that came out a few years ago. Uh, most of you, at least on the guy's side, may not admit to having watched it. But The Princess Diaries, right? There's a great quote in The Princess Diaries. And it was a quote that was originally said by Eleanor Roosevelt, but people tend to relate more to The Princess Diaries. And in that quote, the driver of, of the car who drives the princess around sees that she is hurt by her friend that her friend who she felt would support her through thick and thin, that her friend that she thought she could depend on through everything, ups and downs of life, she hurts her with her words, with the way that she acts. And this young woman in the movie allows that hurt to impact her mindset. And the driver of the car turns to her and says, no one can make you feel inferior without your permission. And it's so incredibly powerful to hear those words. Because when we think of our beloved messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we think of all of the times that he was pelted with insults, that he was put down with words of harm, when he was abused, told that he was insane, astaghfirullah. When we think of what our beloved messenger of Allah experienced in his life, and those who betrayed him, we recognize the importance of having a mindset that is anchored in that love of Allah and the importance of recognizing our value in understanding our connection with Allah. And it doesn't matter if any teacher stands in front of the classroom and tells us something that goes against what Allah Azza wa Jal has decreed for us. It doesn't matter if Fox News or the Islamophobic machines out there guide us towards this idea that we are not enough that we are not good enough, that as Muslims, our faith must be called into question. That is not how we define ourselves. And we see this lack of anchor 
this lack of definition in knowing who we are, creatures that Allah Azza wa Jal decreed to place upon this earth, Creatures that have been elevated by Allah in being given that ilm, that knowledge, and being able to continue to seek it through reason, aql, and fiqr, through thinking. We see that this is who we are, but when we are unanchored, when we are unmoored like a ship that has nothing to hold on to in the sea, we begin to question ourselves, we begin to question our identity. There is a reason why today so many of our youth struggle. And they are not just struggling with am I Muslim or am I American? Am I this or am I that? They are now struggling with am I a male or am I a female? Is my sexual orientation pansexual, demisexual, heterosexual, homosexual? Or what, what orientation, what identity encompasses me? When we look for an identity that is defined by man, an identity that is unanchored from our understanding of Allah, we will be lost. We will be lost because a socially constructed identity is an identity that can change. An identity that is anchored in our understanding of the deen, in our seeking of knowledge from Allah, in our recognition that the ilm that we are gifted with is the ilm that we are meant to use in every part of our life when we are able to turn to this then we find our anchor. Then we find a mindset that is rooted in alhamdulillah, that is rooted in a connection with Allah where we express that gratitude and that gratefulness so that when we are tested by people in our lives who harm us, when we are tested by family members who may break us, when we are tested in ways that sometimes we can't even imagine, we turn our hearts to Allah. One of the stories that was shared with me, and it's something that really impacted me during the trip, the Youth for Jordan trip that I took several years ago, was the story of a young girl named Salam. Salam, her name meant peace. And we often would hear names similar to this in the refugee camps. And Salam was a young girl age 15 and I remember at that time, my oldest daughter was around that age. And when I was talking to Salam and I was asking her, you know, well, what do you want to do, you know, when you get older? A, a, a question that we would normally ask a teenager. She said, well, I'm about to be married. And I said, about to be married? And she said, yes, you know, I always wanted to be a doctor back when we were in our hometown in Syria. But I know now that I have to help my family. I know the sacrifices that my mother has made, and so marrying is all I can do. And she was engaged to be married to a much older man who already had another spouse and who was taking her on as a second spouse at the age of 15. And so I asked her and I told her, Salam, but why? You know, what is it that makes you feel you have to go down this path? You know, as an organization, we can find a sponsor for you. We can maybe help you in terms of going to school. And she said, no. She said, when we were in Syria, it was a dark night and our home was bombed. And she said, my father was able to get us all to safety, but he was killed. And she said, in the darkness of that night, we decided to escape Syria. So it was my mother and my six siblings, and the youngest was just an infant. And she said, we went through unimaginable difficulty to get to the border of Syria. And oftentimes when we work with refugee clients today through the process of resettlement, we begin to better understand the trauma that a refugee encounters, which is pre-flight, flight, and post-flight trauma that is so compounded because of what they go through every step of the way. And she said, we crawled through dark spaces, we crossed difficult boundaries, and we got to the border and we entered into Jordan. And we entered into Jordan and we were accepted into the Za'atari camp, which at that time it was one of the largest UN camps there. But it was also a camp that was very overrun, very overcrowded, that the conditions were sorted. And she said, in the camp, my youngest sibling fell very ill. And we knew that the conditions were so bad there that we couldn't stay. And so my mom wanted to leave this camp as well. But the difficulty was that in this camp, 
there was essentially a group of people that stood at the border of the camp, similar to the mafia, that would not allow anyone to leave this UN sanctioned camp to enter into the country itself because it could cause difficulties in terms of the country. But they would allow people to leave if they paid a bribe. And so she said, we got again in the darkness of night to the border patrol. And she said, we were about to leave, we were about to cross, we were about to make it, and they stopped us. And they looked at my mother and they said, what do you have to give us? A bribe to let her out. And she said, my mother said, I have nothing but these children and the clothes on my back. And so Salam said, they looked them up and down and they told her mother, leave with us the oldest daughter. And Salam said, my sister was just 16 at that time. They said, leave with us the oldest daughter and you may leave. And subhanAllah, in that moment, she said, my mother had a choice. And as I listened to this, I thought, subhanAllah, how could this be a choice? How could this be a choice to choose the safety of your children by leaving one behind? And she said, my mother chose to save us, even if it meant leaving my sister behind. And the oldest sister was left behind. And we know, of course, there are issues of human trafficking and things that occur quite often in these situations. And then she said, but alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah that my mother was able to get the rest of us out. Alhamdulillah that I am here and that Allah Azza wa Jal is giving me the opportunity, the chance to help, to help my mother and help my siblings. And so no, I'm not going to be a doctor. Yes, I am going to marry because my future husband is going to take care of my siblings and take care of my mother. And she said, Alhamdulillah. And in that Alhamdulillah, again, we see that mindset. We see that, that lesson of contentment, of gratitude, of connection to Allah. And while we may not ever face a choice like the choice that Salam's mother had to face, while we may not ever be put in a position where we've lost our homes, we've lost our families, we've lost our livelihoods, while Allah Azza wa may protect us from these difficulties, we will be tested in other ways. And in those other ways when we are tested, we also need to choose. We need to choose if when the world brings us down to our knees, will we put our head down and cry? Or will we prostrate in sujood, thanking Allah, and really recognizing that when we are brought to our knees, it is the best time to pray and to turn our faces upwards. Jazakum Allah khair. Assalamu alaikum.